Greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Steve Clemens. I direct the foreign policy programs here at the New America Foundation, and I am very pleased to have an old friend uh, here with us speaking about uh, Tehran and, and whether strategic communications might help uh, the United States um, in, in Iran. I uh, have a very long and uh, interesting relationship with our speaker, Jim Glassman, uh, who, of course, was Under Secretary um, of State for Public Diplomacy in the Bush administration. I had hoped he would stay on in the Obama administration and was quite explicit about this. Uh, on my blog, even the Washington Note, I thought Jim was doing highly innovative things um, that, that uh, needed to be continued, and I somehow doubt at the moment they are. Uh, I also want to greet those people who are watching on the Washington Note and also the New America Foundation's American Strategy Program website today. Uh, Jim is Executive Director of the George W. Bush Institute, which is uh, based in Dallas at, at uh, Southern Methodist, right, SMU? At SMU. And uh, he is, uh, was a fellow for 12 years at the American Enterprise Institute, president of the, previously of the Atlantic Monthly Magazine, uh, executive vice president of U.S. News and World Report. Um, he has been, uh, I mean, he's been throughout every, er, everywhere in the, the publishing world. He was chairman of the Broadcasting Board of Governors uh, and has a very good feel for uh, both the dimensions of sort of public broadcasting and communications. And what I love very much about one of the first talks he gave at New America Foundation uh, in his new role as undersecretary, he's spoken for us so many times since we were founded and we were just a handful of guys here at the beginning. Uh, it's strange to think back that we've grown from literally four or five people on day one to about 140 people today. Uh, so it's been an extraordinary growth path, and I assume the Bush Institute will have the same kind of thing. But he, he came in and he gave a talk about the role of public diplomacy uh, and framing it that, that his job was not to make the world like America. And I sort of saw it very much the same way. His, his role, he saw it, was a way to create the kind of opportunities for debate, discussion, contention, uh, wrestling with uh, what people felt about their circumstances, even the United States, uh, and to choose that form of, of discussion and debate as opposed to violence. And I thought that was so much more of an informed way of looking at his task, frankly, than his predecessor had done in the Bush administration. We'll just leave it there. Uh, and I also think, uh, to be quite candid, that Judith McHale, while I admire her, we all have to express that, also has not captured that sense of purpose that Jim Glassman uh, communicated at the time. And just as Jim was leaving his position, he also did another interesting thing, was to look, I think, far ahead of, of, of where the Obama campaign had gone, not to say that there was a competition here, but to look at social networking, new media, and look at the arena for a public diplomacy 2.0 uh, portal, if you will, uh, whether it was down dealing with the FARC in Colombia or looking at questions in Iran or, or elsewhere in the world, uh, and I think he was just doing extraordinary work at the time. We met in the 1990s when I worked for Jim, Jeff Bingaman uh, in the Senate, and Jim took uh, um, had a principal disagreement with some of the stuff um, I essentially wrote for the senator at the time, and we've been wrestling over ideas ever since. So please give a round of applause to my good friend Jim Glassman, who's going to share his thoughts with us, and we'll be back to a, to a very good discussion with all of you. James Glassman. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. It's always a, a pleasure to be here at the New America Foundation. Um, as Steve said, during the time I was Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, uh, New America provided me with a, a very generous forum uh, for my views. I gave my, my first speech in Washington as undersecretary here at New America, or not here at New America, but at the old, uh, at the old office, laying out a strategy of public diplomacy that not just aimed at improving America's image. I want to be clear that we don't, we, we still, I think that's important, but it's not the only thing. Um, not just in improving America's image in the, in the long term, but achieving more concrete national security goals, especially involving the fight against violent extremism in the short and medium term. And also here in New America, um, as, as Steve said, I introduced the concept that I called uh, Public Diplomacy 2.0, which deploys the tools of social media in a new approach to communications with foreign publics. And I'm very, very happy to see that um, Secretary Clinton and uh, Under Secretary McHale have picked up on that and really have, have extended it a great deal. Um, I've been out of the State Department now for more than a year. I have a new job in Dallas, as, uh, as Steve said. Um, the areas of focus of the uh, Bush Institute in Dallas do not currently, and perhaps never will, include public diplomacy. 
Um, still, I, and, and I speak here as an individual, not as, a, as an institute official, uh, but as a, let's say, a former undersecretary and somebody who's very concerned about these matters. Um, also, I think it's important to understand before I, before I uh, utter a word about Iran that I have no, as a civilian, I have no special knowledge of what might be done, if anything, covertly or clandestinely, and I think in some cases uh, openly, um, that are being, being done in Iran. Um, still, um, I do think that what is being done is not completely adequate, and I want to talk about that today. Also, just for a small point, um, Steve and I disagree about many things, and uh, one of them is that I was a an admirer of my predecessor, Karen Hughes, and I really don't think that that Karen got the uh, the respect that she should have uh, for many of the innovations. I, I, I admire her. <laughs> okay, fine. All right, so I just want to put that on the record, Steve. Okay, uh, despite a great deal of rhetoric about soft power and smart power, public diplomacy and strategic communications are not today being taken seriously enough as tools of national security by policymakers. In fact, there are areas in the world where strategic communications is not merely one tool, but in fact the best tool for achieving America's interests. And one of those areas is Iran, which is my subject today. Iran, a supporter of terrorism, now developing the capacity to fire nuclear-tipped missiles, is a severe threat to global stability and to American security. Our objective is an Iran without nuclear weapons, and there are three routes to achieving that objective. The first, armed conflict, is, to say the least, undesirable. The second, uh, successful official diplomacy appears more and more unlikely. But there is a third course, the will of the Iranian people producing a change in the attitude of the leaders of the regime or producing new leaders altogether. This third course is no long shot, thanks mainly to the brave opposition movement that developed after the June 2009 elections. It is, this is a course that can be encouraged and nurtured by public diplomacy and other activities that we place under the broader rubric, strategic communications. But so far, almost inexplicably, the United States and its allies appear to have shrunk from using strategic communications aggressively to encourage that third way, the alternative that Iran's own leaders mindful of the success of the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004 and other color revolts fear the most. Why? Well, it's hard to say, but immediately after the, uh, after the uh, post-election green movement protest began in Iran, some policymakers argued that overt U.S. support would allow the regime to tar the opposition with the brush of foreign interference. But even with no evidence, the regime did that anyway, and I believe to very little effect. As Leon Wieseltier wrote in, on uh, December 30th in the New Republic, the U.S. gains no advantage in influencing Iran's behavior through, quote, the suppression of indignation, end quote. Instead, it is the, quote, refusal to side in strong and sophisticated ways with the democracy movement that is impractical, end quote. And I agree with Dr. Wieseltier. Uh, here is the best definition of public diplomacy. Understanding, engaging, informing, and influencing foreign publics with the goal of achieving the national interests of the United States of America. You probably heard that before. And of those four activities, the most important is influencing. Public diplomacy is a means not an end. It is a particular set of tools and approaches that help us influence foreigners in order to achieve goals that the United States desired. We don't do it just for the pleasure of it. We do it to achieve specific goals. The theory of strategic communications is that not only the activities of public diplomacy, but virtually everything, all the activities of government, as well as many non-government actors in a society, send signals that can have a powerful influence on foreign publics and, in turn, on governments. In fact, we practice strategic communications not only when we do things, but when we don't do them. Iran offers a good example of this. 
the tepid response of the United States government to the Iranian protests after the June elections sent signals saying that, one, the Iranian grieve movement lacked the substance and authority for the U.S. to support it. Two, the U.S. itself was too weak or decadent to challenge the Iranian regime by providing even moral support for the Green Movement. And three, the Iranian regime itself was the only source of legitimacy and power in the nation. Those are the kinds of signals that can be sent by inaction. I'm not saying that everyone interpreted the inaction or the, or the tepid reaction in that way, but the point here is that inaction sends strategic communication signals. Over the past nine months, the U.S. government has slowly shifted toward offering more public support for the Green Movement, and that's good. In the next few days, we can expect President Obama to issue a message of Norwood's greetings for the Iranian New Year, as he did last year. And I hope that he will take the opportunity to show clear support for those struggling for freedom and democracy in Iran, and that he will address his remarks directly to the people of Iran, as President Bush did in the past in his New Year's greetings, rather than spending much of the message addressing the regime, as President Obama did last year. But moral support is not sufficient. What is needed is a broad, robust strategic communications program. In an op-ed that I co-authored with Michael Duran, a former Pentagon and State Department official who now teaches at NYU, we outlined that program earlier this year. We begin with a premise that strategic communications integrates words and deeds to achieve a specific political goal. In this case, changing the character of the Iranian leadership. Everything we do, everything we say, everything we don't say and don't do in fields ranging from official and public diplomacy to intelligence to economics to military activity should be coordinated to meet that goal. In addition to providing moral support for the Green Movement, such a policy would have four separate tasks. One, offering lessons from dissidents and advocates of freedom in other parts of the world. We should, for example, publicize reports on what worked in Ukraine or Georgia, spread testimony by leaders like Vaclav Havel, and distribute in Farsi guides to nonviolent change like Gene Sharp's From Dictatorship to Democracy and Peter Ackerman's A Force More Powerful. We can dub into Farsi documentaries on the fall of Kalchescu, Milosevic, and Pinochet, the transitions in South Africa and Poland, and the achievements of the U.S. civil rights movement. Second, tightening sanctions on the Iranian economy and publicizing the connections between regime belligerence and economic malaise. Despite Iran's oil wealth, the economy has for years been in miserable shape thanks to bad management, corruption, and the squandering of funds on Arab terrorist groups and the nuclear program. The slogans of the, pro uh, the protesters demonstrate that they are connecting the dots between the regime's foreign policy and economic privation. Three, doing all we can to increase communications within Iran, as well as between Iran and the outside world. Opposition's movements succeed through sharing and disseminating information. And finally, refuting in campaign style the four key propositions of Iranian propaganda, that the reformers are unrepresentative and unpatriotic, that the U.S. is in decline and wants to cut a deal with Iran and extricate itself from the Middle East, that Iran's nuclear program will advance the country technologically, and that international opposition to the program is a Western plot to keep Iran as a Muslim nation poor and backward. Those are Iran's strategic communications goals, and it does a pretty good job of advancing them. There are some signs of life in the United States. Late last year, the president signed the Voice Act, a bill that authorized the government to spend $55 million, about half of that to increase broadcasts in Farsi by Radio Farda and Voice of America's Persian News Network, two taxpayer-funded broadcasters that are part of the U.S. Broadcasting Board of Governors, which I used to chair. The Voice Act, whose title refers to victims of Iranian censorship, also calls for, quote, development of technologies that will enhance the Iranian people's ability to access and share information, counter efforts to block, censor, or monitor the Internet in Iran, and engage in Internet-based education programs and other exchanges online. 
This is, needless to say, a very good idea. Unfortunately, only about half of this authorized money was appropriated, with, two th- with a third of it directed at China, and it's still unclear what, if anything, is being done at this point, although activities are taking place, moving in the right direction. One step that could be taken immediately at zero cost would be for the United States government to protest vigorously the outrageous jamming of VOA and BBC TV broadcasts by commercial satellite into Iran, and steps beyond protest should also be considered. The Iranians are engaging in the jamming of satellite uplinks, an audacious and illegal activity that causes collateral damage to other broadcasts on satellite, ones that are in close close frequency to the target. What the Iranians are doing on the popular satellite Hotbird 6 has affected not only U.S. international broadcasts, but those of other countries and commercial broadcasters as well. There is no doubt that this jamming is damaging the ability of Iranians to get the truth, not only about what's happening in the rest of the world, but in their own country. A few months ago, the British newspaper The Guardian reported on the effect of jamming of commercial satellite signals on VOA and on BBC's Persian TV, quoting the head of the BBC Farsi network, Sadiq Sabah, as saying, Iranians keep asking me why the West is so powerless. They say, this is a rogue government jamming international signals. How will the West stop Iran getting nuclear weapons if we can't deal with this? A good point. It's a point that also applies, that applies not only to broadcasting. In the U.S., in cooperation with credible non-American voices, we could be launching dozens, even hundreds, of strategic communications programs aimed at changing the character of the Iranian regime. We could use our intelligence capabilities to identify the thugs who are beating protesters. We could be publicizing such Iranian abuses as the jailing of the Elahi brothers, two Iranian AIDS doctors who came to the United States on the International Visitors Program and are now in prison in Iran. We could be backing the launch of other Farsi satellite networks, such as one aimed at young people, and we could be doing more to enable Internet-based communications within Iran. In testimony in February in the House, Mehdi Kalaji and J. Scott Carpenter stated that Ayatollah Khamenei often expresses, this is a quote, his belief that he is in a soft war with the West. For him, all new telecommunication, Internet, and satellite technology are Western tools to defeat him in that war. We should be furnishing that technology. We're not deeply enough in the war that Hamadi believes is taking place. And we can be imaginative. A key tenet of Iranian propaganda is that the West wants Iran to be a technological backwater. Mike Duran and I suggested a campaign including posters and TV commercials featuring Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to encourage Iranians to come to California to be trained as high-tech experts. For now, however, taxpayer-funded broadcasting is carrying most of the load, despite the rejection by appropriators of the $30 million that was authorized by the Voice Act. VOA has the largest combined radio and television audience in Iran of all international broadcasters, with one in four adult Iranians tuning in to a VOA program once a week, at least once a week. Persian News Network broadcasts seven hours of television daily, repeated in a 24-hour format, and five hours of radio. Programming is also available around the clock on the Internet. At the end of December, VOA launched a new web application that allows users in Iran to download and send content to VOA's Persian News Network with their iPhones. The application enables users of of iPhones and Android phones to get the latest news from PNN and then with a single click to send links to to uh, VOA stories via Facebook and Twitter pages and email accounts. The application will be available shortly, the BBG says, in Apple's online store on PNN's website and on PNN's Facebook and Twitter accounts. And Radio Farda is doing... A spectacular job as well, communicating especially to Iranians young to Iran's young people. In our efforts with Iran, we can also employ the approach to communications that I call public diplomacy 2.0, which attempts to displace 
the old technique or add to the old technique of standing in one place and spraying a message widely to others because that's really not particularly effective in today's world. Instead, Public Diplomacy 2.0 generates a wide and deep conversation, and our role in this conversation is as a facilitator and a convener. We generate the conversation in the belief that our views will be heard even if U.S. government actors are not always the authors of those views. This new approach takes advantage of new social networking technologies like Facebook and YouTube and Second Life, whose essence is a multiple simultaneous conversation, or many conversations, in words and pictures. And in fact, this method of communication is itself a reflection of American values. The median, medium, as Marshall McLuhan said, is the message. We as Americans do not dictate, is what we're saying. Rather, we believe that in a free and open discussion, the best ideas will prevail, and we want to encourage the free expression of views, rather than drowning out words that disturb us. Joseph Nye, the former dean of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, has written, If I am persuaded to go along with your purposes without any explicit threat or exchange taking place, in short, if my behavior is determined by an observable but intangible attraction, soft power is at work. Nye's phrase, an observable but intangible attraction, should guide our work in strategic communications in Iran. A heavy hand will not do the job. But efforts to build a huge and free conversation among Iranians themselves will. Iranians are well suited to this approach. Cyrus the Great Cylinder, after all, more than 2,500 years ago, is considered the first document that laid out respect for human rights by a ruler. The Persian civilization is deep and it is rich. It is today being repressed by a regime that is rightly and properly under pressure to change. What can we in the United States do to encourage that change, which is fully in keeping with our own deep and rich tradition of freedom and self-governance? What can we do? A lot. If we continue on a path of indifference, then years from now, when people look back on this time, they will shake their heads and wonder, how can we explain it? How can we understand why the United States did so little? With Iran, people will say, Americans were blessed with remarkable luck. Strategic and moral imperatives stood in perfect alignment. Iranians liked Americans, and the Iranian challenge appeared more amenable than any other to a soft power solution of the sort that Joe Nye talked about. But largely, not completely, but largely, America sat by. That's what people may be saying years from now. But there is a different path we can take, using the tools of strategic communications to support a courageous movement for freedom in Iran and the greater likelihood of security for the United States and stability for the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, Thank you very much. I would, let's take some questions, start a discussion. Um, Jim, you make a very compelling case, and I'm glad you did mention Peter Ackerman. Our audience may not know uh, Peter, uh, who is on the board of the Council on Foreign Relations, and he helped uh, set up a center for this called the Center for Nonviolent Conflict, and sponsored a set of films. Uh, one was uh, maybe one or two were moderated by Martin Sheen, and one of these was a very interesting film that focused on uh, the change of power in Serbia uh, and the fall of Slobodan Milosevic, and how um, these means and mechanisms, and a lot of this began to sort of appear in the Iranian case, sort of marks on buildings, marks on uh, Iranian uh, notes, currency notes, and whatnot. Um, and it, and it, but it raises the question that I think is at the core, and I'm not sure I agree with as far as you'd like to go, but when we watched what happened after the election inside Iran, and you saw death to the dictator, uh, death to America being replaced by death to the dictator, what I worry about is the sort of overwhelm the, the, the overall comprehensive approach that you suggest at a taxpayer sort of national administration level would undo that. And I find that to be potentially highly destructive given our own legacy of actions in Iran in the past. So how do you deal with that question before I open up to the floor? Well, I think it's a good question. I think we have to be careful. That's why I, I, I talk about the tools of public diplomacy 2.0 rather than the tools of dictation. Right. Um, I, do, I do think that the argument, which I sort of dismissed at the beginning because I don't think it's particularly valid, that 
that um, the Iranian movement itself is going to be tainted by our support for it. I, I, I just don't buy that at all. It's already the Iranians are already doing that. They just jailed another six people for allegedly having some kind of ties with us and that sort of thing. So, um, but I do think that we can't be heavy-handed about it. It's not. It's not really. It is, you know, one of the things that I, I used to say all the time and when I was undersecretary is that it's not about us. Sure. It's really about them. And I think what w this is a great example of that. Certainly, it's in our best interest for Iran not to get nuclear weapons, not to be belligerent, not to support uh, Arab uh, violent extremist groups. Absolutely, no doubt about that. But ultimately, this is all about Iran. And I think that's what we need to encourage. And some of the some of the activities that we engaged in in the past, uh, these heavy-handed activities, were not like that at all. Interesting. Let me open the floor to other comments. Uh, Matt Duss. And if I don't know you, it doesn't mean I don't know you. It means I'm blind up here. But uh, please identify yourself. But Matt Hi. Duss with the Center for American Progress. Thanks very much. Thank you for the the remarks. Um, just you said it's all about Iran, but if it's a, a question of public diplomacy from the United States. Isn't it also a question of the United States and our relationships with some of these other governments in the Middle East? I mean, we're seen as backing one of the main complaints of extremist groups like Al Qaeda is our support for authoritarian regimes, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. How are we able to effectively uh, make this argument to Iranians when, they, when Iranian leaders can so effectively and truthfully throw that back in our face? Um, for, first of all, let me just clarify what I said earlier. Um, certainly, we have a major interest in what Iran does, and that's kind of the premise of, of, of this whole talk. You know, I said we really want to get Iran to a position where it doesn't have nuclear weapons, not developing nuclear weapons. I mean, that's a goal of ours, no doubt about that. But to affect that goal really requires action by the Iranian people themselves, not action by us. So we want to encourage that. Um, as far as uh, support for – I'm glad, actually, that you brought up um, what's happening in Arab countries, because one of the things that we don't really recognize clearly enough in the United States is that there is a major conflict going on within the Middle, in the Middle East between Iran, on the one hand, and it's uh, – some people would call surrogates uh, in, uh, in Syria, Hamas, uh, uh, Hezbollah, and so forth – uh, and, on the one hand, and Arab countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, on the other hand. That is a, that's, it's not an open conflict where people are killing each other, but it certainly is a conflict that people in the Middle East recognize much more than Americans do. And I think this is something that we can also uh, use to our advantage in Iran, and I don't think we're using it well enough. Now, that's more on the order of official diplomacy than it, than it is on public diplomacy. Uh, your point about support of authoritarian regimes is something that um, is a thorny problem that we have had for years and years and years. And I don't think, in the minds of many people, there is a conflict for, for example, our support of, of freedom in the Middle East and our support of the Mubarak regime in Egypt. And I can see that. One of the things that we can do in public diplomacy, however, is do things that official diplomacy can't do. So official diplomacy, in many ways, has to support Mubarak and while working to, to try to get a freer Egypt. But public diplomacy can support, as we do, um, people who are – and networks who are uh, advocating for democracy in Egypt. So it's, a diffi it's, it's difficult to square that circle, but it can be done, and we're doing it every day. Hi, I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, you've mentioned use of the Internet in this effort in public diplomacy. Uh, could you elaborate on some of the things that might be done further? Well, I think a lot of what needs to be done is, uh, on the Internet is, is unblocking. Um, the Iranians have become pretty good at, uh, for example, um, the Iranians, um, to my knowledge, I don't know whether this is still the case, uh, canceled or, or managed to stop all Gmail accounts from being active in Iran. And um, Gmail is used by a lot of uh, people in the Green Movement in Iran because it's the most secure way to send emails. It has very good in encryption. 
So if there are ways, and I'm not going to talk about what those ways might be, but there are ways to facilitate such communication, we should be, uh, we should be working on them. And um, maybe we are. I'm not saying that we're not. As I said in the beginning, you know, I may, there may be lots of things going on that I don't know about, and that's fine. I'm not a public official anymore. Um, so that's one example. I think the other example is communications by uh, mobile phone, texting. And, uh, and there, again, the Iranians have a lot of control over what happens within the communications of their own country because they control the servers. But there are still ways to get text messages to people throughout Iran. Um, uh, let me tell you one story. Uh, we have uh, we we recently um, hired as a visiting fellow at the Bush Institute, Mozen Sazagara, whom some of, some of you may know, uh, who was a supporter of Ayatollah Khomeini in 1979. Uh, and was actually one of the founders of the Revolutionary Guard, and then had a change of heart and uh, ended up being imprisoned three times in Iran and finally uh, escaped to the United States. And uh, he he is very active using uh, YouTube in communicating with Iran. Well, just before the um, demonstrations last month, uh, he his all of his YouTube videos, 250 of them, were taken down by an attack which we can assume, or he, he assumes, uh, was, was done by the Revolutionary Guard in Iran. Um, his, uh, his website was also attacked, as were his personal computers at home. Um, happy to say that, um, that the folks at, uh, at Google managed to get his, his, uh, his YouTube videos back up very quickly. But, um, but this is what's going on. And the fact is, we can participate in this. And we as a, as a government, and perhaps even as private citizens, can participate in the facilitation of communications by Iranians within Iran and with the outside world. And I, one of the, you know, I, I admired a lot, of, a lot of the things that Secretary of State Clinton is doing. And I think her, her call for internet freedom is a very, very important one. Um, we need to back that up in Iran with more activity. And I'm not saying, again, no activity is going on, but we need more of it. You know, one of the things I just want to put on the table before I go on, I just because I was out at Microsoft um, learning as much as I could about cloud computing, which we won't get into here. Mm -hmm. But one of the issues that they're dealing with as a company are essentially the rules and mandates put on them by governments in which these sort of massive data centers are based. And all the sort of, you know, you can have a sort of uh, uh, judicial action in Brazil requiring disclosure of information in a data center base there that violates U.S. law. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that may be less Iran-focused but vital uh, and very few people look at it, is this sort of growing problem of, of, of data center placement and the rules that, mm -hmm. you know, of, of carriage, essentially, and, and management, which, which may allow you, if you're able to get an agreement, to create standards that would uh, inhibit Iran's ability to do what it did, I, I, I suppose. It's just something I want to put on the table. Yes, sir. Michael Lame, Rethink the Middle East. Um, for years, I've done management consulting and corporate communication consulting. And, and when I talk to my clients, it's about st before you open your mouth, have a clear purpose. And in two areas, I'm not sure about America's clear purpose. One with regards to a nuclear Iran, that it seems to me statements are all over the map about we don't want it, it's a bad idea, we won't allow it. But that's not been the consistent message. In the absence of a consistent message, we will not countenance it. It seems to me the undelivered communication is we'll try really hard, but we will be willing to live with it. Um, so that's one area. The other area is about this. I'm not clear if you're talking about in support of the Iranian people reforming the current regime or overthrowing the current regime. And, and that communication would be very different if we're, if we're saying it's an illegitimate regime, uh, uh, analogous to Reagan's evil empire talk, directed to the Iranian people, or we want you to include uh, the Iranian people more and stop oppressing them. And that's, those are two different messages. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't speak for 
the current administration. So I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not sure what their objectives are in the two areas that you're talking about. Uh, certainly, in our administration, it was not our objective to overthrow the Iranian regime, despite what a lot of people said. At least it wasn't when I was there. So, so it it, it was not. Um, I think our objective is to allow Iranians to determine the kind of government they want. And it seems to me that that government either would, that that government would end up being a government that is less belligerent. Others will disagree. Some people say, well, gee, you know, the, if the Green Revolution is successful, they'll still want to have nuclear weapons. I, I, I have to say I, 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 I'm, I have doubts about that, uh, that position. But at any rate, I think it would be a less belligerent regime. So is it a question of changing the regime or changing the, uh, changing the regime or changing the regime's policies? Again, I think that's up to the Iranian people themselves, and their voices are not allowed to be heard. What we can do is to encourage them through moral support and through some of the other activities that I'm talking about so that, so that they can affect change in Iran that I think will be, in the end, helpful to the United States. Jim, I'd only challenge you in a friendly way on, on, on one th um, this element of whether you got a reformed government or a changed government, would it be a warmer and fuzzier Iran on, on nuclear issues? Uh, we had the head of Washington Post polling here, surveying a great number of polls that had happened before the elections and looking at them as he would from, a, from the purview of how he would evaluate these polls. And so before the big kerfuffle that followed after the election, and almost everything we looked at showed that whether people were, were supporting Musavi, Karabi, or, or Ahmadinejad, that their view was largely identical when it came to international engagement. There may be difference in postures, but they all supported an effort to engage the West, even Ahmadinejad's forces. But what was really shocking to me is that if they were rebuffed or rejected, you saw a um, uh, near majority, if not a majority, I don't remember the exact number, I sort of have 53% in my head, but don't write that down, uh, supported the moving to a nuclear weapons option, which I had never seen. I'd always been told that most Iranian people were comfortable with the sort of nuclear energy for peaceful uses track. So this, this came before. So I would just throw that out there that that may have to be retested, that you may end up with a, a more representative government using what you're talking about, but it may identify its own strategic course in ways that, that aren't where we'd like, like them to go. Well, let me just say that, that I, I'm not a, an, an Iran expert, uh, so you know, I'm not an Iranologist, but let me just tell you what my view is from, from, my, from my limited experience, that a changed regime would be much more concerned not just about the human rights of people in Iran and their, their democratic rights, but also about the Iranian economy. And I think the most powerful argument in Iran today for change, and you hear this from people in the streets, is that the current regime has mismanaged the economy and that Iranians, even, at a even before the global recession, at a time when oil prices were through the roof, were suffering. And why are they suffering? They're suffering because of mismanagement, because of corruption, because of the use of money to support uh, Arab terrorists, and because of a nuclear program that has won the enmity of the rest of the world. And so I think that a new, I think it's likely that a new regime would say, you know, well, at some point maybe we'll have a nuclear weapon. But right now, we're going to try to get Iran on its feet. Uh, yes, right here, sir. Uh, Sal Chandra from the per Persian Flagship Center at University of Maryland. Um, if the key levers of power are still controlled by the Iranian government, how does the U.S. Um, enabling more traffic on Twitter and YouTube translate to a greater degree of success in the green movements making real gains in reforming the Iranian government? Well, um, you know, Steve mentioned uh, the work of Peter Ackerman and the work of Gene Sharp. And the fact is that while uh, this is, well, uh, civil nonviolent resistance is not a science, there are a lot of lessons uh, to be learned in countries like Ukraine, uh, in many countries around the world where the levers of power are in the control or were in the control of, uh, of very powerful authoritarian forces. But that changes, and sometimes it changes overnight, suddenly. Um, 
So I think that um, I certainly uh, would not despair of the Green Movement um, not succeeding. I think that I, I think that it will ultimately succeed, and it can succeed against a regime that is, in fact, brutal and authoritarian. So, uh, and it's not going to succeed, I don't mean to trivialize, it's not going to succeed because of Twitter, certainly. There are other things that need to be done, and things that need to be done that, that involve not just going out into the streets, but doing things that Sharp and Ackerman talk about uh, under their rubric non-cooperation. Uh, that also tends to work. So, so I don't know what those specific answers are, but what I do know is simply controlling the levers of power that doesn't stop democratic movements. I've talked to Peter Ackerman about this, and he makes a big point about not, he said, we're not talking about nonviolent resistance, we're talking about nonviolent conflict, sort of driving conflict and driving choices with nonviolent means, which you should see this film that they produced. There's a second one, and they've also created a game uh, that I'm just playing with now. I'm not very good at this stuff, but, but you should check out. Um, do we have questions in the back? Yes, in the, in the middle here. Uh, Brian Haupt, uh, Potomac Institute, International Center for Terrorism Studies. Uh, if the public diplomacy 2.0 message is coming not from the top but from people, is there anything that government should do to steer or enhance this message, or should it be totally hands off? No, I think that uh, I think government should um, should help um, push the message. I really do. And uh, what I try to do when I was at um, the State Department, in fact, was to, um, <clears throat> to encourage uh, private sector activities. And sometimes that meant providing a little bit of seed money, providing a little bit of a push. I mean, you know, one of the things that we did was started a group that's, in it that's called the Alliance of Youth Movements. And it was called nothing when we started it. We just pu pulled together a lot of uh, about two dozen um, organizations, online organizations, anti-violence organizations from around the world put them together with um, Oscar Morales, who started the, the movement against the FARC in Colombia online on Facebook, and as well as technologists from the United States, from Google, Facebook, um, from uh, YouTube, Howcast, and so forth. And, uh, and they themselves decided, you know what, let's try to get a whole global movement going here. And um, so we provided, I don't know, I can't remember what it was, maybe $100,000, $200,000 to get <clears throat> to get this going. They started their own 501c3. They've gotten more support. Secretary Clinton is behind this. They just had a big conference in Mexico where the focus was narco-terrorism. They just had another one in, in London. And this is really becoming a, a major sort of public diplomacy 2.0 movement where all we did was give it a shove. We didn't hide our hand. We're not saying, you know, the U.S. government didn't say, well, we didn't have anything to do with it. We did. And I think that's a very good uh, model, and you can see that in lots of other areas. So, and, and ultimately, by the way, the private sector tends to be really good at this kind of thing, much better in many ways than the, than the government is at it. But I, I would not say the government should take hands off, no. Other questions? In the very back. Hi, I'm Kim McBall from the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Um, you mentioned briefly in the beginning about your support for additional U.S. sanctions on Iran, and I was wondering if you could speak a little more to that and whether you think it's possible that could undermine public diplomacy efforts if Iranians see additional sanctions as a way that the U.S. is punishing them as the people because it would have an effect on the public. Well, sanctions are really tricky, and, and, uh, and I, take, I certainly take your point. And let me be clear. I do, I do advocate tougher sanctions against Iran. However, I think that even at the current level of restraints against Iran, the point that I was making is that Iran has behaved, the Iranian regime has behaved in ways that have earned it the enmity of the world. And that has meant some economic hardship. And that economic hardship is one of the things that the Green Movement has seized upon quite properly. It's also seized upon, by the way, the, the, the shame or enmity that I talked about. So I think at current levels of constraint, I think there is, there, there's a lot to work with there in, 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 uh, in strategic communications. Um, so I didn't want to make a big deal about my support for, 
for more sanctions. I don't think that I, I would sort of put that over here. That's not as important as what I'm talking about today. Uh, right here. Morgan Rich with the Heritage Foundation. Uh, while social networking sites are often used to you know, spread positive messages that you know the United States agrees with and everything, um, they're also used by people that don't like us very much. <laughs> and uh, you mentioned um, waging this sort of campaign style um, uh, uh, campaign, I guess. And so how I was wondering if you could speak to this a little bit more and how can the United States make sure that their message isn't getting garbled and confused with, you know, the uh, Iranian message, the regime mm -hmm. message, excuse me? Well, um, first of all, yes, others, the bad guys, can use the Internet as well. There's no doubt about that. Uh, in general, however, when we speak about violent extremists, and to some extent, maybe to a large extent, a regime like that in Iran, we're talking about kind of old uses of the internet, sort of you know Web 1.0 uses, where where they're out there telling people what to do. What does Al Qaeda do with the internet? It urges people to join up. It um, it beats them over the head with ideology. It may use it for training, that sort of thing. It, what Al Qaeda does not do with the internet is use it in a two, Web 2.0 fashion, which is to create a conversation in which dissenting voices can be heard. That's the kind of conversation that people want to enter into today. And um, that's where the networks will be built. And so I think we have a huge advantage over the bad guys today with today's internet. Not with the old directive internet, but with today's broader internet. And um, this is a point that Dan Kimmage, used to be at Radio for Europe, made uh, in a really good piece in the New York Times a couple of years ago about the difference between 1.0 and 2.0. So it's not... I, I owe some homage to him. He, it's not an original thought with me, but it really clicked. And that's why um, at the State Department we tried to expand uh, the use of Web 2.0. And I think in very effective ways, a uh, uh, terrific um, program that uh, uh, International Information Programs Bureau started uh, to encourage people to, to enter a contest on what, what, what is democracy. What is democracy? Give us a video on your, your view of democracy. Democracy is. And brought a lot of private sector, um, pri private sector actors, including NBC Universal and the Tisch School at NYU, into this. And, you know, when you do that, somebody is, is liable, in fact, many people are liable, to produce videos that say, well, my view of democracy is, um, is that it's antithetical to a lot of the things that Americans are doing today. And you know what? That's okay. We don't mind that. That's the kind of conversation actually we want to have and that we want to enter into. So I really think that the way that the Internet has developed is actually quite a good thing. And the proof of this particular proposition can be seen today in Iran. The Iranian regime wants to shut down the Internet. I mean, they actually shut it down. They turned it down so that it was operating at at about the slowest speed you can imagine before the demonstrations in February. I mean, to, to the detriment of their, of their commerce, they even did this. So they're scared to death of the Internet. Uh, Ayatollah Khamenei is scared to death of soft power. So my point is, let's use it. Aren't they, I mean, just, just to take that a step further, aren't they causing their own sanctions then? Aren't they creating their own unrest with their own behavior? Why, why would you need to add on or pile on I, I, in, that, in that particular case? Because, you know, I, during that whole post-election thing, I had lots of communication with people inside Iran. Uh, one of the tricks to this was knowing lots of former diplomats. And again, you know, it's like my Flint Leverett said with his mother-in-law, it's like living in Brooklyn. But I was talking to people who were all dismayed by the behavior of the government, but they were communicating, they were communicating. But so as, as they began to shut things down, shut down the BBC and whatnot, the people are the ones that get angry. Right, and I, look, uh, but I do think we can encourage it. And there's an analogy here with Al-Qaeda. I mean, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda does think, Al-Qaeda, I said this before, sort of contains the seeds of its own destruction. Um, it, 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 it acts, in, it kills fellow Muslims. Um, it does, you know, when you look at, for example, the, the uh, Pew research on support for Al-Qaeda or support for suicide bombing, 
in countries where it's actually occurred, like Jordan or Morocco or Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, support plummets. I mean, in, in a way that, you know, we couldn't do through strategic communications. But what we can do through strategic communications is reinforce the point that this is the way they act. So I don't think that that's a reason for us to pull out, but it is a reason for, um, is, is something to exploit. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, sir, right here. We'll take these two questions and we'll wrap it up. I'm Brad Minnick with the UN Development Program and proud to have been the IV director under your uh, leadership, and thank you for mentioning the two um, Iranians that are still in prison who were visitors. My question is, uh, is there any other country, because Ar Iran is not only a problem for us, is there any other country, in your opinion, that is doing a better job in strategic communications or has the capacity to do a better job than, than we are? I think there are a lot of countries that have the capacity to do it, um, but it is, it's been a disappointment to me. Um, for example, one would expect, and maybe it's not capacity, but sort of inclination or um, the DNA that you would expect would, would mean that they'd be very good at strategic communications. And, and I think the Europeans, for example. Europe is, you would think, would be kind of the home of soft power. And yet, um, the Europeans are not very good at this. Uh, I'm not going to, you know... Name specific countries. I think the, I think the Brits are the best, but I, I think that um, that in general uh, there is just not enough emphasis being placed on this. There really there really isn't. And thank you for your service. And I also wanted to say that the United States has done a a, a tremendous job uh, of trying to encourage the kinds of face to face um, engagement with Iran. Uh, that the Iranians refuse to allow their people to have. Um, for example, uh, you know, we uh, at the State Department brought the Iranian basketball team to uh, Utah before the Olympics, and it was it was fantastic. And the people who were there on both sides, everyone just thought it was terrific. Um, and and I mentioned uh, the International Visitors Program with uh, the two Iranian uh, doctors. These are, these are AIDS doctors. And um, the Iranians shut it down. So I don't mean to give short shrift at all to these traditional kinds of programs that the United States has been trying to, pr to promote. But you can't do it if the other side won't let you do it. So I would just throw in here, because you know, we, we have slight disagreements on Cuba, but I found it very much shooting ourselves in the foot when we actually wouldn't allow the funders and sponsors of the New York Philharmonic to repeat what they did in North Korea and to take this down to Cuba. These kinds of things really do make a difference, but in this case, it was the U.S. government uh, that, that, that shut it down, and I think might be able to find agreement there. I, I won't, I wait, won't wait, push Jim there, on there, it. Let's put it this way. There's more <laughs> chance we'll find agreement now that I'm out of government. <laughs> <laughs> I promise not on to that compromise one. Jim Glassman, Thank who's you. a good friend for at least a year. Because you never know, I might go back in. <laughs> uh, yes, we'll take this question here. Hi, I'm a freelance translator in the D.C. area. Um, at a conference on Iran held last week at the Dirksen Building, Ambassador Robert Hunter uh, mentioned uh, the need to help educate Iranians in the interest of, you know, their own survival in a nuclear world. And I talked to him afterwards. I said, you know, is there any way, has there been any talk within this administration of, for example, people from the National Defense University or the National War College, you know, um, under the auspices of uh, some other institution, you know, meet in, uh, say, Switzerland or someplace with other parties present, with Iranian policymakers there, so that this could be discussed. Um, th you know, the crux of his argument was that the U.S. having engaged in, in the Cold War with the Soviet Union for so many years uh, has a wealth of... Um, strategic thinking and history and practice of it, St uh, nuclear s strategists. And we don't know if Iran has that. Now, is there a way without insulting their intelligence, without coming across as being got, very arrogant with you. our power? Thank you. To uh, I don't know. This is kind of b beyond my expertise. But I would just say, I would yeah. just say the assumption uh, there is that the Iranians are going to acquire nuclear weapons, but we want them to be responsible or we want them to engage in, you know, mutually assured destruction type of deterrence, and we may want them to understand that. I think, you know, we're not quite there yet, and, and the, 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 
what I would hope is that we can use the tools of strategic communications to get Iran uh, moving in a different direction so we don't have to. I mean, it that. is something, I mean, I, I'm not going to take that further, but I will respond quickly that because it is something that, that um, I think about in, 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 a, in a way, and I think the United States can't have that kind of role uh, with Iran of acquiescing uh, to its acquisition of nuclear weapons. That said, uh, Tom Schelling, who won the Nobel Prize for economics for his works on game theory and whatnot, and who made a comment that, you know, game theory is not human behavior. You had to teach the Soviets and the Americans about methodologies of behavior uh, and, and to deal with the whole, whole line of things when he gave his Nobel speech. And I suspect that in that world, if we were to get into that world, the educators will be China and Russia, not the United States. And so mm. you'll work through proxies. But I, I'm going to end it there. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. You. But before we close, would you just give us a quick snapshot of how things are going with the Institute? Oh, I'm right, interested right. in the George W. Bush Institute. We haven't you're, – you're, you, you've just gotten your office here. You've got an office at SMU. What are your big priorities right now? What are you guys doing, and what's the plan for the, for the Institute down the road? Right. Well, I'll do this really quickly. Uh, the, the, first of all, the Institute is kind of a, is, is a unique institution to every, every president – uh, since Franklin Roosevelt has had a library and a museum, and uh, we will have that as well at what's called the George W. Bush Presidential Center in Dallas on the campus of SMU. SMU has given us uh, 25 acres, uh, beautiful acres, and uh, Robert A.M. Stern has designed the building. It will open in three years. But the third piece, besides the archive and the museum, is this institute, which I am heading, and that's really a think tank. Um, but it's a think tank that is um, – very much kind of action, let's call it action-oriented. So it combines um, research and measurable results on the ground and in, in four areas that were um, important to President Bush and that really, I think, have a very much of a nonpartisan appeal of education, global health, um, human freedom, so it certainly touches on some of the things we're talking about now, especially uh, support for dissidents, and the third area is is economic growth. So, so um, and then across uh, all four of these areas, all four of these areas are kind of informed by um, Mrs. Bush's uh, dedication to um, the welfare and progress of of women and girls around the world. So, for example, I'm I'm going to uh, going to Dallas uh, tomorrow because we're having a big conference on Friday. Um, that is that will take off from a an Af U.S. Afghan Women's Council meeting that will take place in Dallas on literacy and education for uh, women and girls in Afghanistan. Then we'll have a conference after that. So, thanks for asking. We, the, the main point is, even though we're not we don't have a building, we don't even have that many fellows at this point. We're actually running. We're doing four conferences in the, this month, and we're actually doing stuff. Well, so. you don't need one. Just come back and speak here. Okay, good. Thanks very yeah. much, Jim. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks for coming.